I want to offer seven guidelines for facilitators interested in initiating conversations across partisan divides. Um, those guidelines are grounded in a personal story. Uh, and I bring to that story the perspective of uh, an independent organizational consultant and coach, about 30 years of experience. My area of expertise is leadership, leadership development. There's an irony there. I've done studies of leadership, published a book, um, done annotated bibliographies of leadership, but have almost no leadership experience. Um, uh, <laughs> the, uh, it's uh, my own version of the neurotic psychiatrist. Um, one experience, however, uh, at least came close. It's uh, one of the most personally meaningful things that I've ever done. I think it had some, made some difference in the lives of others and things that I care about. Um, it's on the basis of that experience that I was invited to speak today. So I'd like to share that story. I've, uh, because of the uh, invitation, nature of the invitation, I've framed it in, uh, in terms that could, might be useful to others. I don't want to presume um, that uh, that you should follow my lead, but I've, I've looked to my story uh, with an eye to what might be generalizable here. And so I'd like to walk you through uh, what stood out for me as uh, a seven steps or guidelines um, for uh, bridging partisan differences. The first, uh, and I skipped over this until uh, it occurred to me only at the 11th hour, but it was really was the beginning, was to uh, get inspired. Now that's hard to plan. <laughs> um, in some sense, it's both the easiest and the hardest. Um, in my particular case, it was an example of, of something that uh, Parker Palmer has helped me understand in a book called Hidden Wholeness. He talks about two kinds of brokenheartedness. One is when your heart is shattered, you're disabled, immobilized. But another is when your heart is broken open and you have a new capacity for joy, for sorrow, for despair, and for hope, and for connecting with your deep caring about something in the world. The way this happened to me was reading the Boston Globe one morning in about 1992, and I read about the demise of a creature uh, that many of you may have no personal contact with, but was a, a familiar uh, playmate and, uh, as I grew up. The, the Texas horned toad was among the amphibians that were beginning uh, to experience a really precipitous decline in population, uh, possibly uh, headed towards extinction. The causes were unknown, um, but human activity was widely suspected to be implicated. And when I read that story, um, and to appreciate this, you need to know I'm somebody who manages to keep his emotions under uh, reasonably firm control uh, at something of a distance, I started sobbing. Uh, there was something about that that touched me deeply. And I knew uh, at a very deep level that I wanted to do something to contribute to environmental sustainability. I didn't know what, but I knew it was gonna be something. And so I, I set the intention to uh, find an opportunity to do that. Now, how to do that? I, I hoped that I could do it in a way that would draw upon my skills as a coach, facilitator, consultant. Um, uh, I, I wanted to do something more than lick, lick envelopes, but I didn't know what. Um, so I began to um, browse, if you will. Uh, I heard about a conference at Tufts University on environmental sustainability. I went to some of the workshops there, and I learned about something called the Northern Forest Lands Council, which had been created uh, by federal mandate to do hearings in an area of intense conflict that had emerged regarding the disposition of 26 million acres of forested land in four states, New York, New Hampshire, Vermont, and Maine. It seems that the, uh, the land which uh, had been in the ownership of, uh, primarily of 
uh, timber companies was now uh, uh, at risk of being sold because it was no longer as profitable as it was as logging moved to the south. Um, and so developers were the potential owners of this, uh, this forested land. And that put a number of stakeholders into motion uh, and, and in conflict with one another. Um, the, 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 the timber companies wanted to protect their economic interests, which might mean selling the land to the highest bidder. Um, environmentalists wanted to protect as much forested land as possible. Property rights uh, advocates wanted to minimize federal regulation of, uh, of the land. Uh, sportsmen wanted to retain access to hunting, hunting and fishing opportunities. You can imagine that rich stew of conflict. Well, at the hearings, I learned, of this council, uh, people tended to, in that public audience, in that formal setting, um, uh, make speeches that talked past one another, mainly with the press as their audience. So there was little learning, little exchange, certainly no real uh, dialogue. Um, it looked like there might be an opportunity here somewhere, but I didn't know how to establish myself um, or you know, kind of put an oar in the water. Um, but I had the, uh, as I was just uh, opening myself up to uh, a sign for what might be a way to get involved, uh, the winds of grace just gently blew open a door. And I saw the following quote in the uh, a newsletter called the Northern Forest Forum said, representatives of uh, the various groups that have often been at loggerheads, no pun intended there, I think, should retire to the woods to get to know each other, develop some trust, and see if we can move beyond the us versus them mode. And this was written, uh, it was a quote from a staff member of, a, of an association of timberland owners. When I read that, I thought, yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's my leverage point. So I went to a, a, one of these meetings of the council and I just began to buttonhole people and have conversations which for an introvert were very uncomfortable, saying things like, uh, you don't know me, but I got an idea. I'd like to run it by you, uh, <laughs> get your suggestions, and see if you know anybody who would be interested in participating or sponsoring. Um, and that, uh, that led somewhere. Uh, it wasn't entirely clear where it was gonna lead, but what happened was that one name kept uh, uh, appearing over and over again, a guy named Steve Blackmer, who at the time was at the Appalachian Mountain Club, and people use the same phrase. He's a bridge person. He's somebody who has credibility in multiple constituencies uh, across these uh, stakeholder uh, partisan boundaries. So I uh, approached him, uh, ran the idea by him, he liked it, and we then together began to come up with a, a list of people uh, who also would have credibility across multiple constituencies. And we convened uh, a group of about half a dozen, uh, bro broadly representative of uh, those different uh, stakeholders. Um, in doing that, in parallel, this might have even have come earlier, uh, what I found the need to do just instinctively as a consultant was to, to map the, the history of the conflict. I, I interviewed the people who were on the uh, emerging convening team uh, people they suggested, uh, those who might be candidates and some who probably were not for actually showing up for uh, a dialogue. So it's just understanding the who, the what, the why, the what's the, the history, um, broader context, you know, the, uh, the, the current state, what were the issues, what were the personal animosities and conflicts. Looking at power dynamics, uh, interestingly enough, almost everyone thought that other groups had more power um, uh, some felt more marginalized than others. I would say the property rights advocates who were kind of the equivalent of uh, contemporary uh, Tea Party members uh, felt the most uh, 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 on, the, on the margins. The idea was to be able to come to uh, a gathering, both uh, by identifying people and then designing it so that we really were stepping into it with some knowledge base of what to, what to predict and how to make it a safe environment. So working with the committee, uh, and I use the word collaborate uh, here and I'll use it again, working collaboratively, uh, the way I uh, managed my own dilemma of, of bias, that is to say I, I was not a neutral 
uh, in this uh, situation, I, I was inclined just by default uh, on, to be sympathetic to the side of the environmentalists. But my, I knew that my credibility as a facilitator would depend on, on being perceived uh, as, and, and, and genuinely being, neutral. Well, that came from just taking a, collab a consistently collaborative stance and giving as much ownership as possible to the people who were um, emerging. So they were the ones, obviously, who made suggestions about uh, the candidates. There was always a, the challenge of, of striking the right balance between inclusiveness and, and diversity on the one hand and uh, a willingness to constructively participate or, or predicted willingness uh, on the other. Uh, as you can imagine, those towards the, uh, the further uh, ends of the uh, ideological spectrum uh, often tended to see things uh, in more black and white views and uh, to express themselves with appropriate uh, passion, which might or might not be conducive you know, to coming together for a, um, for a dialogue. We issued 35 invitations and then, uh, excuse me, uh, brought them together uh, for a meeting, uh, the, the design of which was, uh, was very interesting and another uh, collaborative challenge. Uh, in this case, I engaged with a, a, a subset, an, uh, an interested subset of the convening team, uh, but with checking in with the, the larger group as we uh, went through various iterations. What I found was that I was bringing process expertise, um, uh, things like uh, ground rules, uh, for, for guaranteeing a kind of a, a container um, and a safe environment for people to, 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 get, to uh, have an exchange. Um, the, I relied on the, the convening team to identify the particular issues uh, to address, uh, whether to bring in speakers, uh, things like that. Um, we recommended, I recommended, uh, and at this point I say I, by this time, I had recognized my own limitations in uh, importing my facilitation skills from uh, organizational settings into this kind of multi-stakeholder environment, and I realized there are probably people who know things about this. <laughs> uh, and so I approached the Public Conversations Project, which had a reputation in this area, and then created a partnership with uh, Maggie Herzig, who also, by the way, contributed to my thinking about this presentation. and and could easily be here doing it herself, has written about this. I'll give you the references at the end. Um, and uh, uh, particularly with, uh, with uh, guidance from what uh, Maggie and her colleagues had learned at the Public Conversation Project, we learned to invite people as individuals, not as representatives of organizations. We wanted to speak from their experience. And that was very consistent with our philosophy of help them get to know one another as persons uh, before you go into the issues. A favorite tool of the Public Conversations Project, uh, I remember reading about this when they brought together pro and uh, pro-life and pro-choice people, was tell us a story from your personal experience that has shaped your views on this subject. Very powerful. Uh, Wordsworth once wrote, uh, if we knew the secret history of our enemies, it would disarm all hostility. And that, uh, that, that way of thinking, I think, served us uh, uh, very well. Um, 24 people came together in zero degree weather at a fireplace heated lodge in a remote section of Vermont for two days. Um, we had a design and it was uh, very, very much oriented towards getting to know one another first. Um, we had tentative uh, plan for even for, the, for day two, but the idea uh, was to as much as possible, rely on uh, participants to shape what happened, to use what we came to call uh, emergent design. So having a plan, but being willing to shape it, to alter it, to uh, abandon it if necessary, in the interest of letting people uh, determine for themselves what the key issues were and, um, and how to approach them. Um, we, went in with a deliberate, uh, deliberately withholding a tendency to plan a sequence of meetings to kind of envision where the project should go because the, the risk would be that the convening team itself became a new kind of a authority structure. Uh, so we wanted to engage the participant energy. And that, uh, that, that proved to be uh, uh, a wise lesson, I think. The, and I'm, I'm calling it here just to, to foster emergence of, uh, of participant 
ownership. So uh, the impetus for a, a subsequent meeting did emerge. In fact, we had a series of meetings, uh, both region-wide among the four states, then some that uh, evolved to focus on the particular interests of the Adirondacks. Um, on the basis of this experience, Maggie and I were invited to co-facilitate a, a, a larger, although more focused initiative called the Maine Forest Biodiversity Project. That brought together about 120 people, or up to between 90 and 120, several times a year over a period of about five years in Maine, looking at issues of, of uh, forest biodiversity. If I think about what emerged from um, these, this is not the occasion to talk about the particular outcomes. Um, there were a few tangible products outside of meetings. Didn't try to come up with them uh, within. Uh, a, a manual for sustainable forestry management uh, was written by environmentalists and uh, managers of timber companies. The uh, very interesting issue uh, project emerged around science. As, as you know, people often disagree about what the facts are and they respect different uh, authorities when it comes to the uh, relevant science on a topic. So in Maine, they had trouble uh, d uh, agreeing on what the state of biodiversity was. So uh, the project decided to do their own research. They engaged a scientist that had credibility uh, from someone from Maine across uh, different boundaries uh, to, to conduct some, got some grants to conduct some original research. Uh, and that shaped their, their policy. But the main thing that emerged was uh, relationships. Just the tendency, let's say, uh, I remember one example of an, uh, uh, an uh, member of an organization, an, an uh, activist organization, about to publish an op-ed piece on the Northern Forest, and he ran it by a, a, a representative of the timber company, saying, what do you think? Do you see any flaws in my argument? Could it be framed in a way that would make it more accessible? So as I step back, you know, for, about my story, hoping it has some relevance to you, could take you as it did me from uh, being a bystander on the sidelines to actually getting engaged in something that I cared about, uh, exercising leadership, which even for a leadership development consultant was a, <laughs> a somewhat rare experience. Uh, I've offered seven guidelines. I think that I could actually collapse them into three. Uh, let your heart get broken. Um, formulate an intention grounded in your caring, and trust emergence. Thank you. <laughs>